Well, good evening, and welcome once again to Wednesday Night Bible Study as we sneak up slowly on Palm Sunday, which I am so excited about because we're going to open the gates of the temple and we're going to strew palms on the conqueror's way and we start live church, in-person church, this coming Sunday at 9 o'clock. And I hope you will be there. If you're not, if you're still hesitant, we understand and hope you will watch us just like you have been. But I am looking forward to starting Holy Week in our sanctuary. It's good to be with everybody tonight. And I found a book that I thought was especially appropriate for the last week before Holy Week begins. It's a short book called The Passion of Jesus Christ. And it's 50 questions about why Christ had to suffer and to die. And I've picked two of those questions to talk about tonight. And one of them, the first one, has to do with justice. And justice is a buzzword in today's society. Everybody, every small group, every group that feels oppressed is talking about justice. So I think that's a very appropriate word for us to look at. So let's get started. And let me throw something at you very quickly that might get you thinking a little bit. And I want you to know that if God were not just, there would be no reason, no demand for Jesus to suffer and die. And then, if God were not loving, there would be no willingness for Jesus to suffer and die. But thank goodness God is both just and He is loving. So His love is willing to meet the demands of His justice. God's law demanded, you know this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your might. But we have all loved other things more than God. And that's what sin is. Sin is dishonoring God by preferring other things over Him and acting on those preferences. So the Bible says what? All, you, me, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We glorify, friends, what we enjoy most. And sometimes it isn't God. And what we enjoy, we get passionate about. We become active and actively involved in it. And we become wrapped up in what we enjoy. So sin is not small because it's not against a small sovereign. Our sin is against holy God. The seriousness of an insult rises with the dignity of the person we insult. And the creator of the universe is infinitely worthy of respect and admiration and loyalty. Our respect, admiration, and loyalty. So failure to love him isn't trivial. It's not something to just poo-poo. It's close to treason. Therefore, failure to love Him defames God and it destroys our happiness. But since God is just, He just doesn't sweep these crimes underneath the rug of the universe. He feels this holy wrath, this anger against them. They deserve to be punished. And He has made it clear in the book of Romans where Paul tells us the wages of sin is death. And then Ezekiel, the prophet, says, the soul who sins shall die. That's pretty clear, pretty clear. There's this holy curse, if you will, hanging over all of sin. And not to punish that sin would be unjust. The meaning, the, 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 the demeaning of God would be condoned. It would be endorsed. And a lie would reign supreme at the core of our reality. Therefore, God says, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of law and do them. But the love of God doesn't rest with that curse and allow it to hang over all of humanity. He's not content to show wrath, no matter how holy it is. Therefore, 
God sent his own son to absorb his wrath and bear the curse for all of us who trust him. Galatians says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And that's the meaning of this theological word we use sometime, propitiation, in the text that we quoted a minute ago from Romans. And it refers to the removal of God's wrath and providing a substitute for it. And the substitute is provided by God himself, and the substitute is Jesus, his son. And it doesn't just cancel that wrath, but Jesus absorbs the wrath and diverts it from us to himself. God's wrath is just, and it was spent. It was not withdrawn, not at all. So we could, shouldn't trifle with God, or we shouldn't trivialize his love. We'll never stand in awe of being loved by God until we reckon or till we deal with the seriousness of our sin and the justice of his wrath against us. But when, by grace, we awaken to our own unworthiness, then we can look at the suffering and death and death of Christ, and we can say, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the wrath-absorbing propitiation for our sins. So there we see exactly how much God loved us and why he had to suffer and die. And I want to leave you with this part of our message tonight, our lesson, with a verse that you know very well, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. Folks, you and I are Christ's friends, and indeed, he laid down his life for us and then rose again. That's where we're moving to the day of resurrection. Pardon me, naturally. That was the preacher from Kingsway. He knows better than to call me right now. So let's go to the second reason why Christ had to suffer and die. And it was to deliver us from the present evil age. Until we die, or until Christ returns to establish his kingdom, we live in the present evil age. So when the Bible says that Christ gave himself to deliver us from the present evil age, it doesn't mean that he's going to take us out of the world, but that he will deliver us from the power of evil in it. Jesus prayed for us like this. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Now, the reason that Jesus prays for deliverance from the evil one is that this present evil age, and that is the word of the Bible, that's not my wording, is the age when Satan is given freedom to deceive and destroy. The Bible says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, and this evil one is called the God of the world. That's with a small g. And his main aim is to blind people, you and me, to the truth. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And I think sometimes we're in great denial until we awaken unto, to our own darkened spiritual condition. We live in sync with this present evil age and with the ruler of it. You once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's what Paul tells us in Ephesians. Without knowing it, friends, we have become slaves of the devil. What feels like freedom isn't freedom, it's bondage. The Bible speaks straight to 21st century fads and fun and addictions when it says they promise freedom but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. 
and the resounding cry of freedom in the Bible is, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. In other words, don't be a slave, be free. Don't be duped by the gurus and the experts of this age. They're here today and they're gone tomorrow. And one enslaving fad follows another. 30 years from now, today's tattoos will not be the marks of freedom that they are today. Rather, they'll be indelible reminders of conformity, just wanting to be like the herd. The wisdom of this age is insanity in view of eternity. Let no one, the Bible says, deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. Friends, when Christ went to the cross, he set millions and millions and millions of captives free. He unmasked the fraud that the devil threw at us and broke his power. That's what he meant on the night before his crucifixion when he said, now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Folks, don't follow a foe that has been defeated. We need to follow Christ. It's too costly not to. We might be an exile in this age. We might be ostracized. We might be shunned for being a child of God and for following Christ. But I can guarantee you this. You'll never be a slave to sin. And we will be free when we do the things that Christ expects of us. So, two things that we need to know why Jesus had to suffer and die. It's a question I've been asked by teenagers for the last 40 years when I was doing youth work. It's a question I think many of us might ask ourselves. He has all the power in the world. Why did he have to suffer and die? Well, he had to suffer and die so that we could have eternal life. No question about it. I am so excited about this coming Sunday and the opportunity to worship in-house with you and see faces in front of me, smiling faces. I went to church this past Sunday, live church with Ashley up in Franklin, Tennessee, and there were roughly 250 people in that worship service, and it was almost alive with electricity the spirit of just togetherness. I hope you are as looking forward to being together as I am. Wear your mask. We will socially distance. We'll do everything that we're supposed to do. And we will praise God together on Palm Sunday. We will process in, weather allowing. We will carry palms. And we will shout, Hosanna. And I'm looking forward to it. It's good to be with you, and I hope to see all of you next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. Have a good rest of the week. Goodbye now.